for the last time we said that there are three main uh, building blocks for potential flow elementary uh, flow models if you like the first one being the uh, uniform flow this is a source or sink source being if you guys remember an infinitely thin infinitely short pipe which is giving water away or fluid away ra radially outwards and the sink is just the other way is sucking the, uh, the fluid in to a point and then we spoke also about uh, the vortex flow where the streamlines which, which in, in all these examples are the blue lines the streamlines are uh, circular lines okay they go around a, uh, a point a circular point which is the center of the vortex and we derived equations well kind of wrote down the equations for the uh, stream function psi the uh, velocity potential phi and also I'm not showing all the equations we, you can work out you can actually easily work out the velocity components from those and we started our discussion how you then you combine so remember all these three models each one of them satisfy the Laplace equation which is uh, what potential flow is satisfies the Laplace equation but Laplace equation is linear which means if I combine any of these guys in any manner the results also satisfies the Laplace equation so this is a key key idea about potential flow so we started with the first one which is basically says uh, if I have an XY coordinate which is uh, located at let's say the center here at zero and what I do I put a source on the left and a sink to the right and they are so the sink is distance a from uh, from zero this is distance a but to the left and what I do is I just make them approach each other very very closely and as they do that they generate this flow picture okay which is basically a series of circles tangential uh, tangential to the x-axis and really one way of thinking about it probably I didn't say this last time is basically flow comes Think about it as, as if the flow comes from a source and then it goes into the sink. Can you guys see that? So flow comes, comes out and then it kind of goes to the source. So you get something called the doublet or the dipole. So again, don't worry about the uh, stream function equations. Uh, so that's the final uh, form for the stream function and the velocity potential. Okay, so that's the doublet. In a way, you could, some people actually consider the doublet as a building block, okay? But really, it's <coughs> you can't get the doublet unless uh, you put the sink and source together. But it's actually quite a fundamental example in uh, aerodynamics and hydrodynamics, and that is the flow around the circular cylinder. Now, a circle is obviously the, one of the simplest shapes around, but still very, very important uh, to look at. And you will see, hopefully, how some of the ideas develop from looking at the flow around the circular cylinder. Now, of course, we are aerospace engineers. We want, at the end, we want flow around an airfoil or a wing. But you will see, hopefully, how these ideas develop into that. So let's start with that. So to get a flow around the circular cylinder, and I'm calling it non-lifting, means there is no uh, lift produced. Okay, what do we do? We get a uniform flow, add it or superimpose it uh, with a, a doublet. If you do that, you get exactly a flow around the circular cylinder. So in this case, the dividing streamline, the thick line here, is, can be replaced by a circular cylinder of the same shape, uh, which means I am actually uh, uh, modeling the flow around the circular cylinder if I just take that streamline and put a real cylinder, you get exactly the same flow picture, which effectively what you're doing. So, um, but this flow picture is non-lifting, and I hope you guys can see that. Anyone tell me why it's, this is not uh, non-lifting? If you guys remember from year one, looking at the flow picture, round, symmetrical, someone said, yeah, top and bottom, yeah. So there is no, uh, uh, there's nothing in the vertical direction. So we, just by looking at the flow picture, you guys can see there is no lift. There will be no lift. This is why it's called the non-lifting cylinder. There are two stagnation points in this flow. One uh, here at this location and one at the front. In terms of theta, this is theta equal to zero and theta equal to pi, because as we go around the circle. So th those are the two stagnation points. So remember, we have two stagnation points now. 
Uh, the other thing you guys might have noticed is the flow symmetry only in the y direction or is there flow symmetry in the x direction? What do you guys see? Is there flow symmetry in front and at the back? Yeah, yeah very good, yeah? So what do you expect for the drag? What do you guys expect for the drag? We agree all there is no lift because um, top and bottom is, is symmetry of flow. But also, really, symmetry between at the front and the back. What do you expect for the drag to be? Zero. Zero. Right. We'll get to that in a minute. So just by looking at the flow picture, you know lift and drag will be zero from that. Okay. So uh, in terms of, again, don't be scared by the equations. This is just uh, really combining the stream function for the, f the uh, free stream plus the, f the stream function for the doublet, which is in the free previous slides. For phi, we're also adding the uh, velocity potential. So this is the velocity potential of the free stream flow. This is the velocity potential of the doublet. You literally add them together, which is great. So you just add things together to get the, uh, the final psi and phi. OK. The dividing streamline, which is the, uh, the surface of the cylinder itself, the outer surface of the cylinder, has uh, psi equal to zero. So here the constant is just happens to be zero. And uh, we just, we can create, we can, we can call this circle of radius A or when, when R equal to A. Okay, so um, it will have a radius of some, it will have a radius A basically. We can do some maths and show that um, U times A which is, this is the radius equal uh, mu. Remember mu is the strength of the doublet. Okay, that's the strength of the doublet here. Sorry, where am I going? And that's it really. So the strength of the doublet then can be written also like this. So you can uh, substitute this equation here and here if you want. So let's, let's uh, just do some little bit of mathematical um, changes. So. Again, we're going to just rewrite the psi and phi in uh, polar coordinates. They can be shown to be written this way. So remember, A is the radius of the cylinder. R is the, 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 the radial distance. And of course, we can derive the velocity components from psi and phi using the, the Cauchy-Riemann equations, if you guys remember them, and we can get Vr and V theta. <coughs> so we can show... Now, we want to look at the surface of the cylinder because uh, uh, that's what we are interested in, exactly on the surface of the cylinder. We're not interested inside the cylinder, of course. Just like a wing, we're interested in what happens on the surface of the wing. So, on the surface uh, of the cylinder, when R is equal to the radius A, okay, remember here we don't have any radial speed, we only have tangential speed, okay, so the flow is tangential to the surface of the cylinder, okay. If this was a viscous flow, what would be the total speed at the surface? You guys remember? Zero. Zero, very good. What do we call that condition? Boundary condition? No, non, non-slip condition, very good. But here, there's no boundary layer. So the velocity, there is a velocity at the surface of the cylinder, and that's the tangential velocity. There's no radial velocity, of course. And it's given by this equation. You can show that stagnation points are, remember I told you there are two stagnation points. Let me just go back. One at the front at pi equal to zero, at theta equal to zero, sorry, and theta equal to pi. So one at the front, one at the, at the back. Those are the two stagnation points. Okay, very good. Now, remember I told you last time potential flow is useful because if I know psi and phi, I can derive the velocity components. From the velocity components, I can know the pressures. From the pressures, I can calculate the forces. That is ultimately what we want. So let's do this for this uh, uh, circular cylinder. Okay. So uh, we can we can use Bernoulli's equation in this form. Okay. And we can show that the pressure on the on the surface of the cylinder where r is equal to a, okay, where r is equal to the radius, that's where the surface of the cylinder is, can be shown to be it can be written this way. Okay, so we're just applying Bernoulli's equation. And you can show that the pressure coefficient around the surface of the cylinder as I go from 
uh, theta equal to zero and I go around the whole circle to theta equal to two pi, you just can just a general, uh, general equation which is one minus four sine squared of theta. So obviously as you vary theta, i.e. you're going around the circle, this value of CP will obviously change. And this is actually plotted in the graph uh, at the, uh, above. So this is your CP, this is theta, not sure why it says beta here, but I corrected it to theta, and then we're going from zero. In this case, I'm just showing you half the circle. You can imagine you can continue to two pi. But this is how it looks like. If we plot this, basically, we can get this thick line, and this is how the CP looks like. Remember, guys, the CP is basically the non-dimensional representation of, of your pressure distribution, right? Now, at the same time, we are, we are actually plotting what happens to CP around the circular center in real life. And you guys can see they do not match. They only, well, they match a little bit here, maybe on this side, but really in general, they do not match as we would expect because in experiment, that's a real fluid it has viscosity. We can have flow separation and the rest of it. So it's no surprise those two lines do not match, okay? But at least the general shape, I think, there is similarity in the general shape. So you can get some variation from this theory for CP in this form. Right, let's look at CP again. If I ask you a question, guys, from last year, okay, um, CP equal to one, what does that mean? What does that represent? Do you remember? CP equal to one? Steve? Stagnation point, yeah. What's the value of uh, C, uh, okay, I said that already. So from here, how many, where are the stagnation points? Where CP equal to one, what's the value here of theta? What's theta here? Zero. Zero, and here? 180. 180, very good, which is exactly what I said here. Yeah, one at the, one at the front, uh, well at the back at theta equal zero and this one 180, and that's it. So this is proven by the CP again, which confirms those two stagnation points. Right, uh, let's just think about, can anyone tell me, just from this graph, which values of theta you think the CP is zero, where CP is zero? What's the first one? 30 degrees, yeah, very good. What's the other one? 150, very good. Obviously, if you continue, there will be two other points where... The CP is zero. Do you guys remember roughly what do we mean by, what does it mean in terms of the pressure value when the CP is zero? Just by looking at the definition of CP. What do you think the value of pressure here is equal to? Negative. No, we're getting zero, remember. Is equal to free stream, yeah? That's what it is. So. When CP is zero at these thetas, it just means the pressure at those points is free stream pressure, right? That's, and if you just put PR, P at R equal to A equal to P infinity, then of course you get zero. So try to think about that graph and what it means in terms of the flow around the cylinder. And is, obviously this is uh, one of the kind of uh, famous equations in uh, potential flow for a flow around the cylinder. All right, now remember I told you, ultimately we want the forces. So let's integrate the forces in the x direction to get the drag, integrate in the y direction to get the lift. Now, I'm not going to do the derivation. I actually left it for you uh, in, in the slides. Uh, you can read it in your, in your own time. Uh, okay, so the equation for the, 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 the y component of the force, Fy, which, as I said, represents the lift, is written in this way. And the one for in the x direction or the drag direction is given in that, in that form. So it, if you integrate, you will find that in this case, indeed, as we expected from the flow picture, then there will be no lift because there is symmetry. Okay, so that's fine. But it turns out also the drag is zero. Now, of course, from the flow picture is fine, but do you guys agree that the drag should be zero in real life? Any, any, any reasons why the drag should not be zero? What, what's the main reason? Viscosity, someone? Yeah, very good. What does viscosity do? What type of drag we get with viscosity? 
viscous drag from the boundary layer. Yeah? Very good. What's the other type of drag we might get? Pressure drag, very good. Which, what, you, what is it from? <laughs> it's from the flow separation of the boundary layer. So, potential flow says there is no boundary layer. So clearly, we get zero drag, which we know in real life doesn't make sense. And at the time of D'Alembert, he, he's the guy who uh, came up with this problem. So we know that the lift is zero, but from experiments, people at that time know that the drag is not zero. So they were kind of baffled why this is the case. It seems there is a contradiction between what the theory gives and what we know from real life. In real life, we know that the drag is non-zero and is greater than, of course, zero. But during the, from the theory, it just gives us zero drag, which doesn't make sense. This is famously known as D'Alembert's paradox. Um, Gauthier, how do we say it? What is Gauthier? How do we say D'Alembert? D'Alembert. The English say D'Alembert. I don't know why. But. Okay, so the result of zero drag is known as D'Alembert paradox since it is in direct conflict with what we know from real life. Okay? So explanation, as you guys offered, is because in real life we know the fluid is viscous, and that will lead to the creation of the boundary layer. The boundary layer gives you the viscous drag, but also if the boundary, boundary layer separates, it gives you pressure drag both of which are not covered by the potential flow theory, and therefore that's why we get zero drag, which of course is nonsense. So you, you guys can see straight away that one of the biggest limitations in using potential flow is that it can't calculate the drag. Okay, you just get zero drag. Right, so that's uh, one of the key conclusions. Right. So that was a non-lifting case. So let's look now at a lifting case. And to be honest, if I was sitting in your seat, I would be wondering, why do I care about a lifting case with a circular cylinder? It doesn't really, uh, doesn't kind of um, link to you straight away because uh, again, we're aerospace engineers, but some of the ideas, remember at that time when this potential flow theory was going on, there was no really aerodynamic theory of wings and stuff. So. Uh, they were looking at a lot of uh, cases with cylinders and stuff. But nicely, it led to a lot of the ideas for air force and wings. Anyway, so let's look at a lifting flow over the circular cylinder, which we also call, this case, we call it spinning cylinder. So to achieve that, what you need is you take a, a, a uniform flow, add a doublet, but now we add a vortex. Remember, non-lifting case only had uniform flow and a doublet. If you add a vortex of strength uh, capital gamma, then uh, you will get uh, a lifting case for a cylinder. So actually the cylinder will give you a, uh, a non-zero lift uh, in the upper direction. Okay, so we can learn immediately that if you want to generate lift, you, you need to add a vortex model. Without a vortex, you can't generate lift. So this is one of the first conclusions. So again, these are just the equations for psi and phi. Don't worry about those. Uh, however, D'Alembert paradox still exists, even with the lifting case, okay? The drag is still zero, which is nonsense. So that kind of still there. But at least now, we are generating some lift. Okay. In terms of the streamlines, you can get around the uh, circular cylinder. It all depends on the value of the strength of the vortex, which also we know as known as circulation. And for various values of capital gamma or circulation, we can actually get various pictures of the flow. And actually, if you think about it, if, I, if you just change gamma infinitely, you get an infinite number of physical or possible flow conditions. And I'm just showing you those four there. And basically what you can look at is how, for example, the stagnation points vary uh, in their location by changing the value of, uh, of, uh, of uh, lambda. So when, it's, when the circulation is zero or the strength of the vortex is zero, you get uh, basically the non-lifting case, which makes sense, right? We just go back to the non-lifting case, as if there is, there is no vortex. And we have these uh, three conditions here. Uh, so when this value here, which relates to the location of the stagnation point, really, 
uh, is less than one, you get this flow condition uh, with the stagnation points uh, at the same location, but not the same flow behavior. And when it's equal to one, the there is a stagnation point at the top, and when it's greater than one, you get, it, you get the flow behavior like this. Anyway, so you can imagine an infinite number of solutions depending on the value of, uh, of the circulation of the vortex, okay, or the strength of the vortex. Right, so um, in terms of the location of the stagnation point, we can show that through the, the angle theta, this is related to the strength of the vortex and the uniform speed in this, using this equation. And that's why I'm using actually uh, that formula there. Now, however, the, the case of lifting cylinder led to a very, very important uh, solution or equation for the lift. This is one of the, f one of the famous equations in aerodynamics, and it's called the Katajikovsky theorem, which actually tells you uh, what is the lift around, uh, um, around a, a lifting cylinder, okay? But also, the beauty of it is actually you can apply it to any 2D shape. It's not just for c cylinders. You can have it for any 2D shape, including, of course, for us, airfalls. So if I have an airfall, and I have a potential flow going through it, and I make sure there is some form of circulation around the airfall, then I can actually calculate the lift of the airfall using this same equation, which is basically the density times this, the free stream speed times the circulation around the airfall. Okay? Is everyone clear? And that's the beauty of this equation. So, really, uh, Ah, uh, need to put this on. Of course. And then we need to zoom. Yeah. So, what I'm saying is, if you have an airfall, okay, and I have a free stream flow coming with a speed u and a density rho, is it clear? Roughly. Then, the Kotler-Zhukovsky theorem says that the lift around this airfall is simply rho times u times a circulation, capital gamma, around that airfall, okay? And that's it. You can actually use this equation to calculate your lift. And of course, from lift, you can get the lift coefficient. And that's a very powerful result for as, as, as far as lift generation is concerned, All right? It's a very important result for aerodynamicists. And you can actually, obviously the devil is in the detail. How do you get an estimate of that circulation? That's the problem. But for now, assuming we know how much circulation around the airfall, you can get the value of lift. Okay. I'll just to finish this part. I'll just, these are just some uh, practical examples. This is uh, a high speed vehicle with shock waves. And actually this potential flow theory, you might be sitting there thinking it's absolutely useless. No, it's not. It's actually uh, quite useful. We can actually apply it to, actually to model uh, vort <coughs> vortex flow itself of surfaces. And in this case, I hope you guys can see there is some vortices coming off the surface here. And if we look at them uh, behind the, the body, for example, we know there are some vorte vortex flows and we can actually use uh, vortex, the vortex model to model those. Okay, and you get some picture of the flow behind the body. So they are very useful. The, this, is, this picture, I'm told, is just, uh, again, modeling uh, the, the behavior of a vortex with time. Uh, and that's, that could be used or that could be achieved using the vortex model itself. Okay, and actually gives you something uh, rough, roughly close to reality. So again, this is using vortex model. And for aircraft, we can also, well, this is actually not, this is a missile. If you look very carefully, this is a missile. And we can actually predict some uh, uh, vortices coming off the surface or vortex lines coming off the surface. Uh, probably not enough streamlines for this particular plot, but at least you guys can see uh, we can model some uh, vortex lines off the body using potential flow theory. So, it's very applicable. Now, how do we actually use potential flow in real life? Now we know we have to get the, to get the correct 
values for the forces, we know we have to include the boundary layer, okay? So what people do is they solve, they use potential flow to solve the outer flow most of the time, and then the boundary layer, they just use models for boundary layer, and then they add together, they add them together to get the total, uh, the total flow picture. And actually, you can do that without having to use things like CFX, which you guys are using for your uh, coursework. So actually, you can solve the flow by having a potential flow model plus a boundary layer model. Add them together. That will give you, that will give you the total picture. Okay. So coming, coming to summary for this part, we can say the following. So if, you have, if you've forgotten everything we've been talking about, hopefully some of these pointers will remind you. So we said that potential flow is, by definition, is inviscid plus irrotational. Inviscid meaning we're ignoring viscosity. Irrotational means the flow particles are not rotating about an axis which, is, uh, which moves with them. So they're not rotating about their own axis. Potential flow can be described via psi, the stream function, or phi, which is the velocity potential. If we know psi or phi, we can work out the velocity, the velocity components. And from the velocity components using Bernoulli equation, we can uh, find the pressures. And from the pressures, we can find the forces, as I showed you in the case for lifting and non lifting cylinders. That's exactly what we used uh, to find lift and drag. Potential flow building blocks are Uniform flow, source or sink flow. Remember, source and sink are basically opposite to each other. Okay, so uh, if one is positive, usually is the source. The sink is just negative. And the vortex flow. These are the building blocks of potential flow models, which means we can add them together to create more interesting flow pictures. And just to remind you that we said that for sources and sinks and vortex flows, they all have singularities at the origin. Okay, so we need to be careful of those. Remember, singularity means something goes to infinity, which is, of course, unbounded, unbounded, or something goes to zero. Both of those are singularities. Okay, all these building blocks, they satisfy the Laplace equation. Therefore, we can add them to get a solution which itself satisfies the Laplace equation, and that's the main uh, advantage of potential flow. And then we looked at combinations of these building blocks. We said that if you have a uniform flow plus a source, that is equivalent to modeling the flow about a half a body, okay, in a uniform flow. And if you have a source plus a sink, uh, which are close, very close to each other, you get a doublet flow or a dipole. Then uniform flow plus a source plus a sink, you get the Rankine oval, and then Uniform flow is a like doublet. You get non-lifting flow about circular cylinder. What do you think is the next one? Uniform flow plus a doublet plus vortex, vortex to get what? Lifting flow. Yeah, very good. That's what we've just been discussing. Uh, lifting flows cannot be represented by sources alone. They require vortex flows. Okay, that's just from the two points above. So if you want to create something with lifting force, you have to have a vortex flow is involved, otherwise there will be no lift. We spoke about the D'Alembert paradox, which says that with, in potential flow, the drag is zero. We know that's not true, but that's what it gives you. Uh, and to calculate the lift for an, a lifting case, we can use the uh, kotta jigovsky theorem, where the lift is just the density times, the free stream speed times, the circulation. Uh, so you can actually use that equation. Now, as I said, that equation is true for any 2D shape, including airfoils, not just circular cylinders. <laughs> so you can apply it straight away to your airfoil. Right, that ends this part of the lecture. Before I move on, do you guys have any, does anyone have any question? Or a thought or a comment? No, okay. <laughs>